Um, so here's uh, your really, really crude basic picture of climate change. Um, uh, Earth is in principle in balance. It gets energy from the sun and its energy back to space. Um, those two arrows would be exactly the same in equilibrium, uh, but greenhouse gases, primarily CO2, uh, trap the heat uh, in the atmosphere, trap the infrared, um, and making it harder for that to escape, and the Earth has to warm up at equilibrium. So that's um, been known for quite a long time. In it, the basic approach for managing that, of course, is stop putting the CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, geoengineering, in principle, describes two different things. I'm going to focus on one of them, um, and then Jeff will focus on the carbon dioxide removal. So there are, it is possible to affect this problem not just by limiting how much CO2 you put into the atmosphere, but in principle by directly taking it back out after you put it in. Um, and then the one that's um, uh, potentially ethically more, more challenging, um, I realize I made an edit to this at the last second and then I never saved it. Um, it is also possible to uh, interfere with the incoming path um, in order to restore the equilibrium and prevent the climate from warming. Um, so this is referred to as solar radiation management or solar geoengineering. Um, sometimes I'll just refer to that as geoengineering uh, or climate engineering. They all mean the same thing. There's two principal ways that we know how to do that. Uh, the first is just by analogy with uh, large volcanic eruptions. So this is a picture of Mount Pinatubo. Uh, this is the last time we had a really big explosive volcano go off it was 1991 in the Philippines. That put about 30 megatons, there's a fair amount of uncertainty in that number, put about 30 megatons of sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere. Um, your atmosphere dynamics 101, um, the troposphere where we all live is heated from the ground, so the sun warms the surface, hot air rises, so the troposphere is convectively unstable. Um, so you're, that's where all of our weather is and so forth. You go up into the atmosphere um, at say, you know, it varies, varies with latitude, but it's say like 60,000 feet. Um, it stops getting, you know, temperatures gradually getting colder at about 60,000 feet, it starts getting warmer again because it's heated from the top because ozone absorbs UV from the sun, ultraviolet from the sun. It's heated from the top, that basically makes it stable hot air rises, so if the upper layers are, are the hotter ones, they're stable. Um, and that basically means that if you can put stuff high enough up into the atmosphere, um, so think 60 to 70,000 feet, um, it'll stay there for about a year. Um, and so if you put enough aerosols, basically small droplets of sulfate, um, in high enough in the atmosphere, you can cool the planet. Uh, and we know this from every large volcanic eruption. So this is just a temperature record. Um, so Krakatoa cooled the planet for a little bit, Santa Maria, um, Agung in 61, El Chichon 1985, Pinatubo. Um, and in fact, there's, you know, there is some effect even out here uh, in the early part of this century from a number of smaller eruptions um, that may have uh, helped cool the planet a little bit between about 2000 and 2015. So this is effect is very well known, um, and in principle, the basic motivation for geoengineering is to say, hey, we could do this ourselves. Just take a bunch of airplanes. Nobody has airplanes that can get that high, but in, you know, in principle, it could be done. Fly airplanes up to the stratosphere, release sulfate aerosols, and I guarantee you, simple energy balance, guarantee you it will cool the planet. Um, that's not necessarily a good idea. Uh, but depending on the trajectory we're on for climate change, it's not obviously a bad idea either. Um, the other way to do it is actually much more uncertain. Um, this is a satellite picture off of, uh, I actually can't remember where this, do you remember? I think this is off South America, but I can't remember now. It's just a um, standard picture that a lot of people show. Each one of these lines is a cloud, and at the front of this cloud is a ship, that ship puts pollution, um, and that pollution acts as uh, nuclei for cloud droplets. Uh, and so behind that ship for about the next week, this is probably where the ship was a week earlier, and this is where the ship is today, um, basically you wind up with a cloud. Um, and that reflects more sunlight, and so there's sort of this idea that you'd basically build these autonomous ships that would just spray salt water into these clouds. Um, that would reflect some amount of sunlight away. Um, 
This sounds a lot more benign in a way to just make clouds brighter. Uh, there's two problems with this. One is uh, we don't really know if this works in any meaningful sense of the word. Um, that is, we don't know uh, that under what conditions um, putting aerosols into the clouds actually makes them brighter and under what conditions it doesn't. Um, and the other thing is, if this only worked over something like 10% of the planet, if you're adding CO2 that sort of warms the planet broadly, and then you're trying to cool that off by putting a really, really big forcing in a really small area, um, I guarantee you you're going to have some very interest, interesting and not well understood um, climate physics. Um, so I'm going to mostly, as example, I'm mostly going to talk about uh, uh, stratospheric aerosols because that's the one that's better understood that we know with certainty we could do. Uh, but there are also other ideas and, um, uh, that are out there. Um, one other thing I'll mention really briefly, uh, the amount of sunlight you need to reflect. Uh, people have talked about things like painting roofs white. There are not enough roofs on the planet um, to make an appreciable difference. You paint your roof white so that you need less air conditioning. You don't paint your roof white because the amount of sunlight you reflect will make an appreciable difference to the temperature of the planet. Um, so I'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about the context of climate change. This pointer is not uh, really waving it around for my benefit. Um, so I'll talk about a little bit of the climate change context, why we're talking about solar geoengineering and not just focused on cutting carbon emissions. Like, why don't we just say, let's go all solar and wind. Um, a little bit about what we know about it, um, and then I'm going to mostly skip um, talking about some of the challenges on the human side and the governance, because that's basically the second and third session. Um, and I'm going to leave out an enormous amount of detail, so feel free to ask questions about all the things that I don't say. Um, so here's your very uh, little bit of history on climate change. Um, you'll get a little bit more on this from, from Jeff in the next talk. Uh, so this was noted in 1896. The basic physics behind this was actually understood before that, in about the 1850s. Uh, but 1896 is sort of the first, first, first time that somebody explicitly pointed out uh, that if we burn CO2 from fossil fuels, we'll warm the planet. Um, he was a Swede. Uh, thought this was a good idea and actually proposed that maybe we should burn lots of fossil fuels just to warm the planet. Um, that idea basically sat there for uh, at least 50 years or so with at least two basic flaws. Uh, one was people said, uh, we put CO2 into the atmosphere, the oceans are just going to absorb it all. Um, that is in fact where all of our CO2 is eventually going to wind up. Uh, and the second flaw was people pointing out, well, uh, water is also a greenhouse gas, so water also absorbs infrared. Um, and so they basically said that effect is already saturated. Adding more CO2 isn't going to actually uh, cause any more um, water, uh, uh, infrared radiation to be absorbed. Um, and then after World War II, Gilbert Plass um, did much, this is for naval communications actually, uh, did much better job of measuring the uh, absorption bands and concluded that CO2 actually would trap heat, but water vapor doesn't. Um, and then the more critical one, uh, this is the one benefit of nuclear bomb tests. Uh, you can follow the radioactivity um, as a tracer through the ocean for a very long time. Um, and basically, Ravel and Seuss uh, showed that the oceans are not well mixed at all, and it would take of order 10,000 years to absorb all of our CO2. Uh, and building off of that, they then uh, convinced uh, Keeling to go take some measurements. So when, once they realized that the oceans don't absorb all our CO2, it was clear that we're going to be uh, increasing our CO2. So they got Keeling to go measure that, and it only took about three years to show that there was a clear signal of atmospheric CO2 going up. So by 1960, we were absolutely 100% incontrovertible science that adding CO2 to the atmosphere is going to cause the planet to warm. Um, so well before I was born, uh, there was zero doubt in this matter. Uh, in 1965, President Johnson was briefed on climate change. That briefing included a mention of geoengineering, by the way. Um, 1988, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, uh, and a few years later, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was, was signed. Uh, the only other date that I'll add on here is 1995, 
Uh, the IPCC reports have a tendency to be fairly conservative because they have to go by consensus and every country on the planet has to approve them. But by 1995, even that consensus process uh, acknowledged uh, that we were having an effect on the planet. So it wasn't just a, 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 a physics, it was actually measurements that, that we could do that. Um, but we haven't really done a whole lot of good work in, um, over that time period in cutting our emissions. Um, so this is the long view. Um, so just to be clear, when we talk about things like putting aerosols into the stratosphere and you say, wait a minute, you're playing with a system we don't understand very well, uh, not playing with a system is not one of the options on the table. Uh, we are already uh, playing with a system that we don't understand very well and pushing it into a regime in which we have no past experience whatsoever. We have no idea, really, uh, how bad the climate consequences will be. Um, the last time CO2 was this high was a very, very long time ago. Continents were in different places, uh, which means it's a little hard to uh, extrapolate, uh, but sea levels were about 100 feet higher. Um, you can make a reasonable assumption that even if we stop emitting CO2 right now, if you wait long enough, uh, we'll probably be in that same sort of ballpark. Um, so climate change impacts, you probably know or have seen most of this. Uh, Arctic sea ice, it's not just the summer extent, it's also the winter. Uh, so this was last winter, uh, was the record low, almost a record low. Um, Antarctic is probably the thing that would scare me the most. Uh, we've had a, a couple of fairly large ice blocks come off of that. There is enough ice in being held back by the sea ice. Uh, there's enough ice to raise sea levels by four or five meters. We have no idea uh, when that will actually get destabilized, other than the fact that it eventually will if we keep dumping fossil fuels into the atmosphere. It is entirely possible that we're already past the point of no return. Um, unlike Greenland, Antarctic ice melt could happen very, very quickly. Uh, we have basic, but again, we, have, we don't really know how fast it can happen. Um, um, ecosystem uncertainties, you change the temperature very little bit, we don't, uh, uh, it's entirely possible to get unexpected feedbacks in the ecosystems. Um, forest fires, anybody who's paying attention to the news today, uh, this week, um, and just as a, as a aside, wildfire, you know, the cost isn't, you know, human issues is, is in some sense even more important, uh, but the wildfires this last week, uh, are alone are expected to top $19 billion. Um, hurricanes last year in the US alone was 200 billion in damage, um, and we expect there's a link from climate change on that. Um, so what are we doing about that? Uh, Paris Agreement in 2015 said, um, let's make sure the temperature stays well below two degrees um, and try to keep it below one and a half. Um, and right now we're of order one degree. So this is hard. Um, quick quiz, how many people think we're gonna stay below one and a half degrees? Um, how many people think we'll stay below two? A uh, few, how about three? Uh, moderate number, four? Uh, how many pessimists do we have in the audience? How many people think it's gonna be more than four? Uh, we still got a handful of those. I'm not gonna put my hand up. Um, I'm, uh, okay. My guess, is what, my guess is it'll be around three, but that's um, anybody's guess. Um, so what happens if we just turn the emissions off today, if we stop emitting all fossil fuels? Uh, the Earth is not yet in equilibrium with our current CO2, but it's also true that the ocean is not um, in equilibrium with our CO2, with the atmospheric CO2, so we stopped emissions. Uh, the atmospheric concentrations actually drop a little bit. These two roughly balance, so if you zero emissions, you roughly hold the temperature constant. Yeah, to first order. Uh, but there's one other effect, um, and that is that we have a whole pile of pollution right now, um, and that pollution cools the planet. Um, and that pollution mostly comes from burning fossil fuels. So if you stop burning fossil fuels, you lose this cooling. That 0.3 degrees is a guess. Could be anywhere between zero and about one. Um, and so when you go back to think about this one degree, if you zero all emissions today, our best guess is that we'd probably be closer to 1.4. Um, that makes one and a half degrees pretty hard to hit. Um, it basically says you can't. Uh, if you zero all fossil fuel consumption everywhere on the entire planet starting today, we're probably still gonna hit, get close to one and a half. Um, you can stay below one and a half if you also zero out 
uh, methane and black carbon and other things that contribute. Um, or uh, if you ramp down your CO2 very, very quickly and then make sure it goes negative, so you're actually sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere, that's really the only way to stay below one and a half degrees. It's probably the only way to stay below two degrees. Um, uh, this was a slightly different picture on that. Um, you can make a reasonable approximation between global mean temperature and our cumulative emissions. To stay below two degrees, ballpark about 3,000 gigatons. Uh, we've emitted somewhere of order 2,100. And if you just add up what we built in terms of cars and power plants and so forth, that's about another 700. Um, and that would say we're pretty close to the point that if you want to stay below two, you're not allowed to ever build anything on the planet ever again that emits CO2. So you're done with building cars and power plants as of today, uh, roughly speaking, to stay below that. Uh, if you're willing, unless you're willing to just take stuff off the, you know, decommission things early. Um, so here's sort of the big picture. Um, nothing anybody says today changes the fact that we have to do a good job of cutting carbon emissions aggressively, uh, but we don't know where we're going to be able to level out, and there's a reasonable guess that this is more like three degrees. Um, it could be worse. Um, there are things to, that could actively pull CO2 out of the atmosphere that Jeff's going to talk about. Um, the problem with these is we don't currently know how to do, we don't have any ideas right now that are cheap. Uh, can be done at a scale of tens of gigatons per year um, and don't have massive local impacts. Um, so we don't know how fast we can do that and there's a reasonable guess that there'd be some period of overshoot. So when you, we talk about things that could reflect sunlight away, one of the contexts for thinking about it is to say, is it better uh, to follow this blue path than to allow the planet to warm and come back down? And the answer, of course, depends as much on what this green path looks like as that blue path. So if this green path is, winds up being four or five meters of sea level rise, uh, you might say, well, maybe we're better off to put stuff into the atmosphere or not. Um, that's the fundamental problem. And where we're sitting here today, um, we don't really know what either of those paths look like. Um, one important thing, if you're reading any literature on this, is important to keep in mind uh, whether you're comparing the climate here to this climate or the climate here to this climate. Um, a lot of the discussion about solar geoengineering has assumed that one's talking about it like this. That one's assumed that one's talking about it as an excuse not to cut our carbon emissions. Um, in this context, it's just obviously a dumb idea. Um, uh, you, we don't even know if you can actually cool the planet that much. Um, and you'd need to, a commitment for about 10,000 years uh, to do this. Um, so that we, we know is dumb. Uh, this may be a sensible strategy, but of course one of the big uncertainties here is um, if we were to do solar geoengineering, does that actually change how much mitigation we do? Does it change how much, our pathway? Okay, so what do we know? Um, here's our complete list. Uh, it would get cooler. If you reflect sunlight away, the planet's going to cool down. Um, that's about it. Um, that's not quite a trivial statement. Um, a lot of the impacts that we worry about from climate change are directly related to temperature. So that includes heat waves, forest fires, drought, hurricane intensity, uh, sea level rise from ice melt and from thermal expansion, permafrost, sea ice. You, know, you can write a long list of stuff that you care about that's directly related to temperature. Um, even things like shifts in extreme precipitation, most of those are feedbacks the planet gets warmer, therefore the air can hold more water vapor, therefore you get a more intense storms and so forth. Um, and so reducing the temperature, you could reasonably expect would mitigate some of those. But it's um, warming the planet by CO2 and then cooling it by reflecting sunlight is not the same thing. Um, second comment is uh, impacts depend on how it's deployed. So a lot of people will do a simulation, they'll put a pile of aerosols in at the equator, you put them on the equator, you overcool the tropics uh, because the sun shines at the equator as well. Um, and that changes all sorts of things in the climate system. And then they'll write a paper that says, oh, look, geoengineering did all these terrible things. Um, a lot of these terrible things depend on how you do it, uh, what latitude you do, what season you do it. Sulfate aerosols destroy ozone. Uh, other choices might not. 
Um, and so the bottom line is this is a little hard to think about because geoengineering isn't just one thing to think about. Um, we haven't really done a lot of the serious research we need to on this. There's a lot of uncertainty in our climate model projections. Um, but with all those caveats, I'm going to show you some climate model projections anyway. Um, but you should take these with an enormous grain of salt, um, primarily because there's a lot of uncertainty missing here. Um, so here's a picture. These are just scaled from sim recent simulations, uh, scaled to a one degree. So I warm the planet one degree global with CO2. This is sort of the pattern of temperature change I get, pattern of precipitation. Um, in some sense, people don't really care about precipitation. They care about the difference between precipitation and evaporation. Here's the pattern that you get. If you took that degree of warming and then you offset it with stratospheric aerosol cooling, so that this pattern of temperature change is now zero mean, uh, so, that, so the global mean temperature hasn't changed. Um, if, you were, if you did a perfect job and these affected the climate the same way as the CO2, this, all these panels would just be white. Uh, but you do get shifts in precipitation, you do get shifts in, in P minus E. Um, if you just look at these in the aggregate, it seems likely that this column here will have less climate impact than that column. Um, that might be great in the aggregate. Uh, you might notice here, for example, in India, in these particular simulations, it gets a little drier. There's a lot of people who live there. Um, so uh, it's entirely possible that there's people in India who would say, no, actually, um, that's not good for us. I don't know, because a lot of Indian crops are limited by heat stress. Um, but it's entirely plausible that even if, even if this was good in an aggregate sense, that it's not obviously good for everybody. Um, I'm going to skip those in the, that one in the interest of time. This is just a specific scenario that I played with, um, and I'm just going to mark these points again. Um, just to illustrate that, if, uh, this is really illustrating the same thing that's in this slide here. Uh, this does not affect the climate the same way. So if you hold temperature constant at, say, one and a half degrees, um, things like precipitation, global mean precipitation, will actually drop uh, a little bit. It will actually get closer to pre-industrial uh, precipitation. Other things like ocean acidification, you wouldn't affect much at all. Um, and the one other comment, the only other technical slide I'm going to show you is if you do one of these moderate scenarios, it may in fact even be difficult, these changes may in fact even be difficult to discern against natural variability. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they're not important and that doesn't necessarily mean that people won't blame natural, blame geoengineering for the deployment. Um, but in lots of places, uh, you would not be able to establish with confidence exactly what geoengineering was doing. Um, whoops. So what do we know? Uh, it would cool the planet everywhere. It would act fairly quickly. Um, precipitation changes in most, but not all places, would probably uh, be reduced. Uh, if you use sulfate aerosols before about the 2040s, you'd reduce stratospheric aerosols. Um, it's reversible. Uh, that's not always a good thing. That basically means, oh, this does, is fairly dim. You're using geoengineering to hold the temperature constant, and then you just turned it off. Um, if you stop putting these aerosols into the stratosphere, they all dissipate after a year or two, um, and the temperature just goes back to where it was before. Um, and if you were to do that, it's quite plausible that this pathway here uh, is worse than if you'd never started. Um, so another thing to keep in mind. Um, it's cheap. So remember the cost of the hurricanes, for example, in the US last year were 200 billion. Um, I put an X through this picture because recent people have pointed out that you actually can't um, that is a little harder to do than, than um, there was an original paper that said, oh, you could just modify some Gulf Stream business jets. Uh, it's harder to do than that, um, but it's still not fundamentally hard. The estimate is it probably cost about $10 billion. Probably take you about five years to design and build an airplane that would do it. So you can't just start this tomorrow. Um, but 10, you know, that's less than the cost of the California wildfires in the last week. You could start, you could deploy geoengineering. Um, Okay, so I'll wrap up and leave, make sure there's time for questions towards the end. Uh, so these are the big questions. Uh, the big questions in some sense are not necessarily the physical science ones, um, other than maybe this top one. Uh, our models are uncertain. The only way to know for sure exactly what this would, be, would do is to do it. 
Um, how confident do you need to be? The flip side is also true. The only way to be sure of what the consequences of not doing geoengineering are is to not do the geoengineering and find out whether Antarctic melted or not. Um, who gets to decide is probably one of the thorniest questions because um, unlike many environmental problems, uh, this is one of these things that affects everybody on the entire planet. Uh, what happens if some places are harmed? Um, people talk about winners and losers. We actually have no idea right now uh, to what extent uh, there are winners and losers, uh, but at a minimum, I can guarantee you that there are people who will believe they're harmed. Um, how do you manage the deployment for centuries without any interruption? How do you ensure that this isn't taken as an excuse not to mitigate? So I'll tee those up for people to think about uh, in the rest of the sessions today. Um, and I'll just wrap up by saying, uh, in terms of choices, uh, we are a little bit late uh, for having easy choices to climate change, uh, to having like a complete no regret strategy. Um, in principle, uh, more aggressive mitigation alone is not going to get us to one and a half degrees. Maybe it's two and a half. Uh, maybe if you're really, really aggressive, you might believe two. Um, but we have to, essentially you have to pick at least two things on this list and maybe more. Um, so accept significant climate change, um, do more aggressive mitigation, figure out how to remove massive amounts of CO2, um, or do some sort of solar geoengineering. So I'll stop right there. Um, make sure there's time for questions in our uh, Q&A session. Um, so while I switch these slides over, just as a reminder, you can start pointing in questions at any point. Yeah, thank you. How many of you are here because somebody said for your course you have to be here? <laughs> How many of you are here because you're just darn interested? How many of you are here because you had nothing else better to do on a cold Friday morning? Um, so, uh, as, uh, Doug had a, a, a nice uh, introduction uh, to uh, to climate and, uh, and geoengineering, and in very uh, many respects, our talks dovetail uh, pretty well. So, as he mentioned, in 1896, this guy, Spontanarinius, wrote this paper called On the Temperature, or on the Influence of Carbonic Acid on the Temperature of, of the Earth. This was seven years before he won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. So, this guy knows what he's talking about. And he he speculated, or he first he quantified the contribution of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to what's known as the greenhouse effect. And he was really the first to speculate about how changes in carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere could affect the temperatures of, of the Earth and, and may have affected long term variations in climate. Does show this, this curve, this epithelium curve. These are carbon dioxide concentration measurements in Mauna Loa, Hawaii. Uh, anybody know why they picked Hawaii to do these measurements? <coughs> anybody want to guess? Yes, it's geographically. Geographically isolated. Besides the fact that it's a nice place to do research, it is. It, it's in the middle of the ocean, right? It's not near large point sources or large sources of carbon dioxide. So you really get a good amount of, uh, a good measure for how well mixed the CO2 is in the atmosphere globally. Anybody know why it's oscillating up and down? Volcanic presence, I don't know. Maybe because of volcanic presence. So, so very rhythmically, the volcanoes explode or erupted. I mean, why is it happening? <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's a good, uh, it's a, a good hypothesis. And actually, volcanoes have had uh, 
a good contribution to the overall evolution of our atmosphere. Anybody else have an idea? There were a couple of you who were biologists. Right now we have no leaves on the trees. Yeah, spring and the summer when plants and trees and, and weeds are growing, they're sequestering carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. They use the carbon dioxide to, to grow. During the winter, we don't have these, you know, the northern hemisphere right now, we don't have that photosynthetic sequestration of carbon dioxide, so there's no removal, so the CO2 levels will, will increase. And basically, partly it oscillates in part because there's much more land mass in the northern hemisphere than there is in the southern hemisphere. There's much more stuff growing in the northern hemisphere. If we go back to the start of the Industrial Revolution. These are the concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. They do this by uh, pulling ice cores. And in fact, we have the Bird Polar Center. Anybody familiar with the Bird Polar Center? Yeah? Anybody want to be familiar with the Bird Polar Center? I mean, you should become familiar with the Bird Polar Center. It's like the eminent place for ice cores. And what do you do? When the snow falls, it gets compressed over time, over years. And what that, has, what that does is it traps little air bubbles. And so when you drill an ice core, you go down thousands and thousands of years when you pull out a core. And you can basically extract that ancient air from the little bubbles in the ice core. So that's how we can get these old CO2, one of the ways we can get these old CO2 measurements. So you go back to roughly uh, the start of our country. Uh, you can see we've started to accelerate in terms of the atmospheric concentration of CO2. Now, since 1750, most of the uh, CO2 emissions have come from our consumption of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas. It's also been a fairly substantial uh, uh, contribution to the, to the land use change, chopping things down, for example. A large proportion of it has ended up in the atmosphere, as Doug said. Basically, we'll end up in the ocean over really long time frames, and some of it's getting uh, also been taken up through uh, photosynthesis and sequestration in, in plant mass uh, and soils. A broader view of the carbon cycle. This is a graph from the most recent IPCC report on limiting carbon dioxide to one and a third, the temperature uh, increase to one and a half degrees Celsius. I tend to not like using Celsius because we don't use Celsius, we use Fahrenheit. So every, every time I say we hear Celsius, multiply it by 2.2. Not 2.2, that's, that's multiply it by 1.8, yeah. Okay, so basically when we say one and a half degrees Celsius, it's roughly three degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So, the black is, is the baseline, what it was before the Industrial Revolution. The red flows are what human activities have, have done, okay? And so I want to sort of use this as a backdrop for some of the ways that we can extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So before we get to that, if we go back the full data back to year zero, um, from this law dome ice core, you can see CO2 concentrations, and yeah, this pointer does not. Oh, it does work. Relatively flat until roughly 1800, 1850, when they started to accelerate. Now, there's always been natural variability in the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is the last 800,000 uh, years. And so some people will say, oh, climate change is just natural variability. There is a contribution from natural variability, but it's really small. The problem is we know that temperatures are correlated with the level of the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. There's a lot of inertia in the Earth's system. Right now, as Doug showed, we're, we're here. Okay? We are pushing it way outside of the natural variability. Okay? We have temperatures increasing. 
So this is a plot of, if you take the average between 1950 and 1980, subtract that from the actual global mean surface temperature, we're up about 1.7 or so degrees Fahrenheit since the average between 1950 and 1980. If you go back, this is, a, this is in Celsius, you go back to about 1850, you can see our temperatures are, are already more than at one degree Celsius uh, above what they used to be, above what I would say that the Earth wants, would naturally have them be. And so if you project that out by 2100, we're roughly like up here. So we've got a problem, right? And, and oh yeah, so okay, the temperature's right, yeah, big deal. Well, 118 years after Svant Arrhenius published his paper, the IPCC in its fifth report, Doug talked about some of the early reports, every five years or so, there's a new report that comes out with increasing certainty, increasing understanding. The IPCC stated that human influence on the climate system is clear and recent. Anthropogenic, anthropogenic means human activities. Uh, emissions of greenhouse gases are the highest they've ever been in history. And climate change has already had widespread impacts, not just on natural systems, but on the human systems because we are we rely on the Earth's processes uh, uh, for our well-being. So some of the impacts, uh, mid-continents, the poles are warming very fast. Arctic sea ice, Doug showed some, some plots of this. It's thick, extent and thickness are decreasing really rapidly. Some metrics, Greenland has lost about 3,800 gigatons in the last roughly 15 years. Okay. Antarctica has lost about a third of that, to, uh, about a third of that. To give you some sense of the scale, well, the amount of loss, ice that's been lost in Greenland is roughly the volume of the Grand Canyon. How many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? If you haven't, you better be go before you die. Okay. Yeah, so you've been there. You stand on the edge, you're like, holy cow, this thing's huge. You can't even see it all. Okay. Fill it up with ice, that's now gone. To give you a sense, a little bit closer to home, about how much ice has been lost from Antarctica, it's about five million volumes of the chute. <coughs> Multiply that by three, you get how much ice has been lost from Greenland. Okay. So a lot of ice is being lost. Sea level rise has been increasing, and it's been increasing at a <coughs> faster pace. 1930, 19, or 1930, about half a millimeter per year. Uh, between 1930 and 1992, about one and a half millimeters per year, roughly doubled from 1993 to 2017. And since 2010, it's been increasing at five and a half millimeters per year. Are any of you runners? You're a runner. You're a runner. Any of you been to Italy, to Venice? Yeah, so you know they just full of canals, right? And it floods. The reason I have to run is they had a marathon there a, a couple weeks ago. They had to run through water. Venice was flooded. So a little bit, okay, yeah, who cares about melting ice and running a marathon in Venice? Well, closer to home. More rain, more flooding is occurring already. We're having increasing wildfires again. Uh, Doug showed some of this already. Our droughts are getting more frequent and they're getting worse, longer, having more heat waves, more coastal erosion, corals are bleaching. Our storms are getting stronger. Permafrost is thawing, leading in part to subsidence, also leading to emissions of, of, of methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. Pests and uh, pathogens, their natural range is expanding because it's getting warmer. Mosquitoes, who care, are, for example, the disease vectors are, uh, these disease vectors are, are, are expanding uh, in terms of where uh, they're showing up and where people are being, and, and animals and livestock are being affected. Uh, valued species such as fish, salmon, cod, stuff we eat, they're moving and their, uh, their populations are declining. So I'm going to give a brief overview. So carbon dioxide in the atmosphere 
the major contributor to, to climate change. I'm going to give a brief overview of some of the ways uh, that CO2 could be extracted. Okay. So some people, you know, very, you know, we talked about this before, the Keeling curve, uh, the Mauna Loa data for CO2 was oscillating in part because, well, because of uh, uh, photosynthesis and, and uh, uh, CO2 being extracted when a plant grows, it takes in carbon dioxide and sunlight, produces oxygen, uses water. Some people say, well, we just grow more trees. Makes sense. One of my favorite studies on this says, you know, we've been talking about this sort of doom and gloom of climate change. Well, we've had doom and gloom before. We've had wars that have killed a lot of people. We've had plagues that have killed a lot of people. What happens when people die? They're not tending to the land. Forests can regrow. Okay. So the Mongol invasion that lasted 180 years, about 30% of the 115 million people that were alive then died. About 300... 9,000 square kilometers, roughly three times the size of Ohio, was abandoned. About half of that regrew. It only affected, estimates are that it only affected the atmospheric concentration of CO2 as these forests were regrowing by about 0.2 ppm. We're well above 400 ppm now. So you have to, if you have a fair amount of regrowth, you get very, very little effect on the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere that's a problem. And, and Doug and I were talking uh, earlier today, another metric is if you replanted every tree that has been chopped down since the Industrial Revolution, let it grow, that would take out about a third of the carbon dioxide that we've added to the atmosphere. Right? That's, that was the metric. Okay, so, okay, well, ocean, right? We can dissolve CO2 in the ocean, just fix it in the ocean. Great, well, it's already happening, okay? You've got higher concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, it mixes in the layer where the, the oceans are churning, it mixes, the top level of the oceans are acidifying. Some of the effects of this, marine shells, lobsters, um, clams, and so on. Their shells are made of carbonates. You acidify the water, you have a, a base, they dissolve each other. So there's some estimates that say we're not gonna have too many seashells left in 50 years. So we have this sort of grand notion of being a grandparent walking on the beach, holding your grandchild, and as the sun is setting, the waves are slowly lapping ashore, you're picking up seashells, having a nice, we might not have those seashells anymore because the, 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 the marine organisms can't form the shells because they're dissolved. So she can't sell seashells by the seashells. I, I had to stick that in. <laughs> um, ocean fertilization. So there's this, a biologic pump. We can have, we can seed the ocean to grow more phytoplankton, algae and, and so on, that when that grows, it photosynthesizes carbon dioxide, uses carbon dioxide. When it dies, it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. Okay. So you can sequester carbon dioxide from the air by growing more algae. We've recently had a bunch of water quality issues. Toledo, anybody from Toledo? Yeah, did you have to drink Dasani all the time? Yeah, um, couldn't use the water because of the algal blooms, right? It sucks carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, so you can feel good about that. Um, so what happens, again, you grow algae, basically, it dies and falls to the bottom of the ocean, it's sequestering carbon dioxide. Um, the way you would do this is the growth of this algae is limited by nutrients. So you add those nutrients, okay? Phosphorus is one of the uh, macronutrients. It's limiting factor. The phosphorus runoff is causing partly part of the cause of these algal blooms. Let's add phosphorus to the ocean, more will grow more algae, let them die, sink, boom, good. We're extracting CO2. In this, ah, oops, go back. Over here, uh, go back. Okay. On this side of this carbon cycle diagram, have rock weathering. Okay, there's this natural process whereby rocks erode, essentially. In that erosion, 
it can sequester carbon dioxide. So we can enhance this chemical uh, weathering by applying uh, minerals as powders to land and ocean. What it does for the engineers or the chemists uh, or the others, it releases cations in the solution. That cation, those cations remain in solution, causing CO2 to be removed from the, at from the atmosphere, from the solution. But that increases the alkalinity. Uh, over long time frames, it sequesters carbon dioxide in mineral form. Okay, calcium carbonate being one example. Calcium carbonate is chalk. Another form of it is limestone or marble. More technologically, we can separate carbon dioxide using engineered processes. Okay. So we're going to talk basically about highest concentrations, like the exhaust streams of facilities and tailpipes from cars, and lower concentrations like, like the ambient air. Okay. Uh, as the concentration in the as the concentration increases. You want the next slide? Uh, not yet. Oh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you when, okay. I'll be until I replace the battery. Okay, so as the concentration gets, as it gets more concentrated, less dilute, the amount of energy or the cost lowers. The other way to think about that is the more, more dilute the CO2 is in that stream, in the air, where it's 400 parts per million, versus out of the stack gas coal-fired power plant, which is about 15% by volume, <laughs> it's a lot easier to separate the CO2 out of that mixture when there's more CO2 in that mixture. Okay? All right, bam. All right. So things like electricity generating facilities. We can we can do we can basically separate carbon dioxide before we combust coal or before we combust natural gas. There's a number of processes we can steam reform methane, turn into hydrogen and carbon dioxide. We get a nice pure stream of carbon dioxide, burn the burn the hydrogen, for example. During combustion, we can do an oxy fuel, add a lot more oxygen, works really well. We can get up to thank you. Oh. We can get up to like 90% in that CO2, 90% uh, of that exhaust stream being uh, carbon dioxide. Post-combustion, after we've combusted, we have the stack gas, you about 4 to 15% CO2 in that exhaust gas. There are a number of processes, including amines. We do this all the time, actually. In fact, there is a coal-fired power plant in Massachusetts upon which they're capturing carbon dioxide and selling it to Coca-Cola, to carbonate coke. If you're in the Northeast, avoid coke products. The carbonation might be coming from a coal-fired power plant. Okay. There are a lot of different types of industrial facilities. We tend to think of this as a challenge for coal and natural gas power plants, for the electricity sector. It is because they contribute to from these large points, is they're the largest contributor to CO2 emissions. But the industrial facilities, such as uh, cement producers, petroleum refineries, iron and steel manufacturing, ethylene production, ethylene is the precursor to plastic bags, uh, ethylene oxide, ammonia, natural gas, hydrogen, ethanol, we like to think about ethanol being a nice green fuel. It emits carbon dioxide when you're processing it. Okay. So, and you can see the CO2 content in the second column here. Uh, power plants, like I said, roughly four to 15%. Cement producers, you got about 30%. So, add, so some of these facilities, ethanol is actually, can be very pure. Some of these facilities, it's very easy to get the CO2. Okay. So while uh, coal-fired and natural gas-fired power plants are the largest single contributors, of these industrial facilities, there might be lower hanging opportunities from other parts of the economy. So that's where you basically stick a device on a facility, okay? Change how that facility operates a little bit, extract the carbon dioxide. There are other ways that you can say, okay, let's extract it directly from the air, okay? 
a variety of approaches. I'm gonna highlight two. One is this aqueous hydroxide sorbent. Basically, you take sodium hydroxide or calcium hydroxide, run it through a process where it takes CO2, you then you take CO2 out of the out of the air, you then heat it up basically to get the CO2 back. Okay, so you've extracted carbon dioxide using this sodium hydroxide solution. And there are pilot plants that are doing this. And there's a lot of estimated costs for it. There was actually a report written by some very high-powered people that said this is extremely costly. Okay. The most recent paper by one of the groups is doing it says it's about 250 or so dollars per ton of CO2 that you remove. In broad brush strokes, if, if you add about, if it's about $75 per ton of CO2, that adds a few cents per kilowatt hour to your electricity bill. Roughly adds 50 to 100 uh, percent. Roughly could 50 percent to doubling your electricity bill at about $75 per ton. So you're talking, how many of you actually pay your electricity bills? You do. I mean, I'm not advocating that you don't pay your bills. I'm saying other people are probably paying them for you. Okay. Anyway, so, so this is being done. In fact, there's also a facility in Switzerland, Climeworks, that is doing this, not just at this uh, little, well, not necessarily little, but university scale. Uh, a couple years ago, Climeworks actually started doing this and they've been extracting carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Another one I wanted to talk about is this is a really cool one. It basically, you can make things that look like fake bushes with these resins or fake trees. And instead of, in this case, forcing the CO2 through with fans, you let the air blow over it just as the wind naturally does it. The CO2 absorbs to this resin, you wash it off with water, the water washes that CO2 off of the fake bush or the fake tree, take the CO2 out of the water. So some of the benefits of this direct air capture, capturing it directly from the atmosphere as opposed to putting a, a, a device on a facility, like a coal-fired power plant, is that it doesn't target any particular facility. It's getting carbon dioxide from throughout the economy, from all of the sources. If you put a device on a coal-fired power plant or an ethanol refinery, for example, you're sort of taxing that. You're increasing the cost of operation of that facility. This air capture doesn't target any specific facility. Okay? It's agnostic, it gets CO2 from all the sources. It's hard to get CO2 out of a tailpipe. Okay, it's hard, you get hard to put a device on a tailpipe and then do something with that CO2. Here, it's, our, it's in the atmosphere, you're not targeting any particular source. You can get both the large point sources and the dispersed point sources. You can get the engineered processes like coal combustion or you can get, and you can get the natural processes like changes to land cover or the natural respiration of um, uh, wetlands and so on. You don't have the same sort of sighting issues. You could put one of these fake trees or fake bushes wherever you, well, not wherever you want, but you have less sighting restriction. And some people have referred to this direct air capture as a backstop approach for, to, uh, to address the lack of inertia, the lack of uh, technological change, institutional change, policy uh, change that actually would uh, 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 provide for uh, CO2 capture from uh, facilities. So let's say that you've got the CO2, you've got these processes that are taking CO2 away, avoiding these emissions. Now you've got a whole bunch of CO2. What, what do you do with it? Okay. Well, so there's, you can stick it back underground. In deep saline aquifers, depleted oil and gas reservoirs, we've taken fluids out of these. We've taken an oil and gas out of these reservoirs. We're talking about putting another fluid back in, putting the carbon dioxide back in, putting that carbon back where it came from. You can also do it in fractured shale. You can utilize that carbon dioxide 
For the past 45 years, we've been injecting carbon dioxide into the oil fields of West Texas to get more oil. So you stick the CO2 underground, it helps enhance the oil recovery. You can also enhance gas recovery. The problem with, with that is that when you burn that oil and that gas, you're emitting CO2. So you have to look at the, the life cycle uh, of it. Um, you can also, and this is actually some of the stuff that, that we've been looking at very uh, deeply, is circulate the CO2 through, through the subsurface and pull out geothermal heat. You basically run a geothermal power plant by CO2 that you've stuck underground. You can also use it for energy storage to help enable uh, wind and solar penetration. So this is referred to as carbon capture, utilization and storage, CCS or CCUS. Doug mentioned this. One of the things that it can help bring down the atmospheric concentration of CO2 is bioenergy carbon capture and storage. You grow trees, you grow uh, switchgrass, you grow corn, you convert that into electricity and energy. When you're doing that conversion, you take the CO2 that is produced and stick that underground. Okay. So photosynthesis is extracted the CO2 from the air, then you, you then take what photosynthesized the plant matter, turn that into energy, use the energy, put the CO2 underground. It's one of the few ways that we can get negative emissions, and this report basically says we have to go negative. Okay. If we're going to try, have, a, have a, 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 a potential to limit the temperature increase to right around three degrees Fahrenheit, one and a half degrees Celsius, by roughly the mid-century, we're talking like in 30 years, we have to be extracting carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. We are on this path, not that path, globally. You could also, instead of just using that carbon dioxide directly, you can break the bonds of the CO2 and use it to make a variety of uh, commodities, like uh, chemicals, like um, methanol, you can make formic acid, dimethyl ether, all sorts of things that we do use throughout the economy. Here's one of the potential pathways with CO2 and methane, and you use some water, do some reforming, do a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, and, and, and you can get out these products that we use. So you can take the CO2 that you've gotten from somewhere, turn it into a product that you can sell. One of the ways to look at it is you can use it as a, a feedstock, or you can use it directly for energy, biofuels, methanol, and so on. I talked about utilizing it, not in converting. This is where you're breaking the bonds, this is where you're not breaking the bonds. Uh, enhanced oil recovery, like I said, we've been working a lot on, on using it for geothermal. It extracts heat better than, uh, than the way we do uh, geothermal facilities now. Carbon dioxide is more effective at that. And there are some cycles, some power cycles that use CO2 uh, as the, uh, uh, the work we do. A bunch of different technologies for different categories of this carbon capture and utilization or uh, conversion. Um, just talk about some, but they have different types of effects. This geologic storage and so on, uh, uh, you end up with permanent storage in a variety of these. Yes, some of them are only temporary storage that will get re released to the atmosphere. And other things will displace uh, fossil fuel consumption. So the point is we have a bunch of pathways and options for extracting carbon dioxide. The more dilute the carbon dioxide is, the harder it is to do. But we also have many pathways and processes for using that carbon dioxide uh, or, or, or keeping that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So you can store it underground, for example, you can use it geothermal enhanced oil recovery, or you can convert it. Um, you can isolate it, you can displace fossil fuels, and you can use it to produce a product that you can sell. So one of the major questions, though, is do we treat the temperature, try to cool the earth, or do we treat the virus that's causing that temperature, the CO2 emissions? That's me. Thank you for your time and attention. We have a...
right, so these two are both going to sit up here at the table. We already have a few questions in the queue, but if you want to vote on questions or add questions, now would be a lovely time. Following the address on the bottom, go OSU edu slash ask. And then um, my colleague yeah. Lavender will be reading the top voted questions out. All right, so the first question we have from the audience. One moment, please. Woo. Okay, um, if we were to put sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere year after year, where would we get those aerosols from? How limited is the supply of those aerosols? Um, so that's actually, it's a good question. There is actually lots and lots and lots of sulfur. Uh, at least right now, sulfur is a waste product. Uh, you clean gasoline to get rid of some of the sulfur. Um, and uh, I guess I don't know if like 200 years from now we have no fossil fuel consumption whatsoever. I don't know if we're to get sulfur. Um, Good question. But that would be a problem we'd like to have. <laughs> uh, but it is certainly true that what goes up comes down. So eventually, eventually it's going to come down and you have to keep replenishing that. Uh, the other thing just in terms of context is we put about, as a species, we put about 100 megatons per year of sulfur dioxide into the lower atmosphere. Um, it doesn't last very long, so it gets turned over quite quickly. It comes out in a, a border a week. Um, to cool the planet by one degree Celsius or 1.8 Fahrenheit, you need about a tenth of that. Um, so, the, so the amounts that you need are not that huge compared to the uh, availability. The next question is, from someone anonymous. Um, let's do a thought experiment. Say the temp rises 30 degrees. What would happen? Would the Earth cool itself? If so, how would it do it? Are we thinking about this the wrong way? Should we kick the bucket and rise the temp so much that the Earth has no option but to cool itself? Um, depends on whether you're willing to experiment with 7 billion people. Um, I think if you raise the temperature by actually even three degrees Celsius in the global mean, that's probably about six degrees Celsius here, so 10 degrees Fahrenheit here. Uh, that's probably about 20 degrees Fahrenheit in the Arctic, uh, just because the global mean is not, doesn't tell you the pattern of change. So even that is pushing the system really far from our current equilibrium, and we sort of have a reasonable idea of what our models uh, of our models because we can, you know, replay the 20th century and make sure our models capture it. And we can go back to paleo climates and make sure our models capture those. We don't have any experience in what a th even a three degree Celsius change is to be really confident we know what those changes look like. But I think the short answer is a lot of the feedbacks we're worried about are amplifying feedbacks like yeah. melting permafrost. Um, methane hydrates under the ocean and things like that. Yeah, I, w I would worry um, that we cross tipping points, right? And so, and, and so the ocean circulates in a, in a particular way, affects the way our climate is. We are adapted, our, uh, our societies are used to uh, a certain regime of the cli in the climate change. If we go, if we add, if, 30, if we increase 30 degrees, we probably will have a quite substantially different, different climate. Um, probably cross a whole bunch of tipping points, and I don't think the Earth would actually cool itself with all these positive feedbacks. Well, take a look at Venus. Venus, yeah. The reason it's Venus hot. is hotter than Earth is not because it's closer to the sun, it's because it's got a, had a runaway greenhouse effect. Um, in principle, the reason Mars is cooler isn't just because it's further from the sun, it's because it has no atmosphere to provide a greenhouse, or no, not a su sufficient atmosphere to provide a greenhouse effect. And whoever you are, I, please don't take my class. That's a challenging question. <laughs> it's a good thought experiment. It's a good thought experiment, yeah. Next question is, how do we hold businesses and countries responsible for limiting their CO2 emissions? Can we pass that to the law and policy uh, session this yeah. afternoon? Um, <laughs> Do you happen to have any suggestions yourself? Like normative suggestions? Well, I, I think, yeah, so, so one of the challenges is that, are there any economists in the, in the house? You know the notion of public, 
goods and externalities. We're not internalizing the full effects of what we do, right? So right now we have an economy that's oriented uh, and societies that are oriented around disposing or, or just exhausting po pollution. There are some things that we, 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 we do. There's there are policies that have been enacted to try to control some of those flows, but when it's around carbon dioxide, we don't, we don't really have uh, very enforceable mandates to limit carbon dioxide emissions. There have been there's a few parts of the world where there are taxes and, and trading schemes that make it costly to emit carbon dioxide so that the companies have to choose between paying a tax or and, 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 and emitting the carbon dioxide or doing something that decreases their, their, uh, their emissions. Um, part of the problem is that aside from these taxes and um, trading, uh, per tradable permits, um, there's no incentive, there's no economic incentive for uh, um, companies to reduce their, their emissions. So the extent to which we can take the carbon dioxide and convert it into something that they can sell, whether it's electricity through geothermal or methanol or, or whatever, so they have a, a profit motive for avoiding the CO2 emissions or in actually using some of the carbon dioxide, there's, there's, there aren't too many uh, ways that, that we can incentivize uh, uh, companies. I know that there are actually, uh, though, a number of university endowments that are divesting from fossil fuel uh, investments. So there are, there are these other mechanisms, these more social uh, mechanisms. I, mean, I, would, I would point out we do regulate um, pollution from other things. Sure. I mean, yeah. nuclear power would be incredibly cheap if we didn't care about the waste and you just said, oh yeah, you know, you can just like dump all your radi nuclear waste in the river. Uh, but that's basically what we're allowing fossil fuel plants to do. So, so we do have the capacity to simply regulate it. Sure. And, and um, it's a hard thing to do globally. Is it's a hard thing. And, and it, 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 it sets up, and some of the concerns are that it sets up if we regulate ourselves, we basically put ourselves at a disadvantage relative to another country that doesn't yeah. regulate it. No. <laughs> Sure, well. Sure. So you guys mentioned like biofuels and ethanol. What kind of incentives can you provide, like can we provide to like big oil companies like Shell or BP or like Aramco to like stop producing oil and really transition to selling cleaner energy? Yeah, so, so uh, you know, a number of the major oil companies have um, expanded into biofuels. Um, uh, in fact, my PhD dissertation was funded in part by a grant from a company that was, was doing that. Um, and I only buy gasoline from that company now. Um, Which one? Uh, I'm not, I mean, I'll write it down. Um, uh, um, part of the, the, the so, so I think that there, there, there's a little bit of the writing on the wall that they're, that they're responding to. Um, uh, we do have, in the United States, we do have a renewable fuel standard that mandates, or that specifies how much uh, ethanol and biodiesel and, and from and various sources has to be blended into our, our gasoline. Um, part of the problem is that there's no teeth to that. I, I, I said, I did say mandate, it's not a mandate, there's no punishment if we don't meet, meet it. Another part of the problem is that the infrastructure for using ethanol as opposed to gas, gasoline is different. Ethanol actually acts as a solvent, so the seals on tanks and so on that we store gasoline in can't be used for ethanol. It'll dissolve those seals and you get all these, these leaks. So we've got these other uh, issues. And I also so to say there are a lot of companies who have a lot of assets in stocks and reserves of, of fossil fuels. So to, to sort of make them you can understand then they, they've invested a lot in I'm buying this land and these 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 minerals these are our assets all of a sudden you won't let me use that what what the heck right you know so you can understand from that perspective some of the the resistance and some of and, and a, a slower changeover. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, so you mentioned that you know 
Um, so this next question is that the new IPC uh, special report, among others, shows that the next 10 to 15 years are critical for limiting warming to the one and a half to two degree goal. But the chance of globally aggressive mitigation efforts in that time is small. Could aerosols extend that critical period if deployed in the near future? Um. Yeah, so there's a special report that the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, just put out on the impacts of me staying below one and a half degrees versus two degrees and how to do that. Uh, in some sense, I would say it's always critical to cut our emissions now. Uh, it's like we know we're headed for a car accident. There's never a wrong time to take your foot off the gas and put it on the brakes instead. Um, I would agree that there is not been, there's not a, necessarily a great cause for optimism that we're suddenly going to massively decrease our emissions. Uh, what I would say for aerosols is uh, I will virtually guarantee you that we can keep the temperature below one and a half degrees with stratospheric aerosols if we want. Um, we will probably hit one and a half degrees in something of order 20 years. Um, and uh, so if, if yeah, I just want to be a little careful. We, there's this one and a half degree target. That's the context for thinking about things like solar geoengineering. It's not a reason to say we have to do solar geoengineering. Um, if you want to stay below one and a half degrees, I would say it is almost certain that the only way that we're going to actually do that would be with, with things like stratospheric aerosols. But uh, we do not know today whether that would be a better choice or not. Um, my reaction, there's very, very few people who would disagree with me on this. There's only a couple. But my reaction would be we do not know enough today to say we should be putting stratospheric aerosols in now. Um, but I, my concern is that if we hit one and a half degrees in about 20 years, we'd better be prepared over the next 20 years to have done the research so that we can either say, when somebody says, oh my God, you know, we have to go do this now, that we can either say, no, here's why not, it would, it would do X, or if you were to do this, this is the best way to do it, here's what we think the impacts are, here's what we think the uncertainties are, um, here's the additional research that you would need to do if you wanted to reduce those uncertainties further, and at least be in a position where we're making a more informed decision than we are today. Um, I have the advantage of putting, it, putting that decision, so I think that decision point is more like 20 years in the future. Uh, I could be wrong, it could, be, could happen sooner if there's some catastrophic event, um, but I'm, tr I'm trying to push it far enough into the future so that I will retire and all of you get to make the decision and not me. Um, the decision to do research is a relatively easy one. The decision as to uh, whether to decide to do something and who gets to make that decision and how, that's going to be, the, that's the hard decision. Yeah, in part because you're changing the course of global activity, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, not just like natural systems, but human activity uh, uh, too. And, and I, I would say, you know, so, so Doug mentioned, you know, if you're, if you're driving um, in a car, uh, sort of the, the prudent thing is to take your, you know, you know there's an accident up ahead, or you, the prudent thing is to take your foot off the gas. I would say if, you, if you're driving in a car and you know there's a cliff up ahead, and it's foggy and it's at night, which is the situation <laughs> that we have with respect to the potential uh, effects of, of climate change, uh, slow down. Like, none of you accelerate, right? No, in that situation, none of you would, would put your foot in the gas and say, no, I'm going for that cliff. I don't know when it's coming, I'm going for it. Prudent thing, is, well, maybe some of you might, but uh, prudent thing is to slow down uh, if you want to stay alive. It's foggy. It's theoretically possible, but there's no cliff. It's theoret it, it, <laughs> there, there. theoretically possible. The cliff is right there, right in front That's of the, the It's theoretically possible we've gone over the cliff already, and we just haven't. Like, our, our momentum fall. on the car, we haven't quite felt the. the yeah. yeah. That's the way I would describe Antarctic. Yeah, yeah, past the point. Yeah. Next question. Uh, Two questions related to aerosols. First is that, uh, would there be interaction effects between releasing aerosols and removing CO2? Would aerosols be as effective at cooling the Earth if there were significantly less CO2 in the atmosphere than there is now? Um, I think other than the political and societal dimensions, I think they're decoupled. So I can certainly imagine that if somebody starts, that, that 
if we were putting stratospheric aerosols in, that could change the incentives to cut CO2. Uh, I'm actually not even sure of the sign of that. Although the sign that would worry me would be, oh great, we've got this solution, now we don't have to worry about uh, cutting emissions. Um, so on the, there's, there's clearly a coupling on the societal side. I don't think there's any coupling on the physical side. Um, the, in, in terms of the overall forcing from the sun, um, we're talking moderately small percentage perturbations. So we get about 200, sorry, I'm using metric units. I use Celsius. <laughs> um, 240 watts per square meter uh, from the sun is absorbed by the earth on average over the planet. Um, we're talking about perturbing that by a few watts per square meter, um, which, you know, we're also a long way from absolute zero. So, you know, a few watts per square meter is, winds up, or a few percent perturbation winds up being a notable perturbation in our temperature. Um, but these perturbations are at least a first order linear. Thank you. Um, and the next question related to aerosols is that, has there ever been roughly the same concentration of aerosols in the atmosphere as there would be if we were to release them in quantities needed to significantly cool the Earth? Um, uh, and if so, what can we learn? Yeah, so that's, that's an excellent question. Um, this is one of these things, there is in some sense a, a past experiment on this because it's called volcanoes. Um, so in a sense, we know when you put large amounts of stratospheric aerosols in, uh, you know, we have at least some vague idea of what that does because we have observations after volcanic eruptions. Um, and some of those eruptions in the past have been large enough to be really, truly catastrophic uh, in terms of collapsing agriculture worldwide. Uh, there's a, I just saw some headline in the New York Times the other day about they finally pinpointed some, some eruption that was responsible for a massive uh, 532 AD, I think it was. Um, so there's certainly been time periods where there's way more aerosols up there. What's different is uh, volcanic eruption is, bam, you've got all your aerosols because it's explosive, um, and then after a year or so they all disperse. Uh, and we're talking about sort of injecting them a smaller amount continuously year after year. So the main thing we do is we actually use the volcanic uh, data sets, observations, to calibrate our models um, and then use that in running our models. Um, I probably left a half dozen things out. Well, I was going to say one of the things with volcanoes, too, is they emit carbon dioxide as well. And yeah, and they also emit ash and, yeah, and all sorts of other nasty yeah. things, too. Well, and so, so you guys are probably familiar with the advance of the glaciers, right? You know, so millions of years ago, glaciers covered half of North America. Actually, they've shown that the glaciers got all the way to the equator, okay? It's called the snowball earth. And so you have this white earth covered in, 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 in ice, so the, the sunlight can't, can't get in, it gets reflected by the white. So one of the questions was, well, if you have the snowball earth, what was the mechanism that caused the glaciers to retreat? There's no effect on the greenhouse. It was volcanoes that popped through, emitted carbon dioxide, had the, the effect of, 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 of warming up the planet that caused the glaciers uh, uh, to, to, to to, uh, to retreat. So we can get a lot of um, anecdotes and points of departure for trying to understand various mechanisms and processes and develop technology such as injecting yeah. uh, aerosols um, from natural events. Um, uh, there's often uh, a number of effects from those natural yeah. events as well. So um, just a couple of other comments on this is one is um, what we learn, for example, from observations of Pinatubo is a lot about stratospheric chemistry, a lot about how the aerosols form, um, how they change stratospheric circulation. Uh, we know that it cools the planet, but we sort of know that just from straight up energy balance. Um, when a large volcano goes off, one of the other things you see is the land uh, cools down faster than the ocean. And if you lived in a place like India, a lot of your precipitation is monsoonal. So the land gets very hot, that sucks moist air over the land, and you get a lot of rain. Uh, a volcano will very rapidly cool, um, and you will get a significant change in the rainfall in places like India. That is not necessarily analogous to what happens if you're just constantly putting a small amount in. So you have to be very, very careful in interpreting the impacts from volcanic eruptions 
and applying those to uh, geoengineering. person asked, where does alternative energy come in? And I want to combine this with another individual's question. Would aerosols have effects upon the efficacy of those alternative energy sources? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I think my answer to the first one of that is we should be aggressively cutting our carbon emissions as fast as we can. Um, and um, that basically means transitioning to wind and solar as fast as we can. Uh, my concern is simply we can't do that fast enough. Um, if you aerosols, one of the other things that happens is, is uh, sulfate is actually not a very good backscatterer. So in order to scatter some of the light back to space, you actually scatter a fair amount of the light. It still comes to Earth. It's just instead of being direct, so the, the actual, you know, if you look at the sun, the sun will be a little bit less bright. I don't think you'll notice it. But the rest of the sky will actually be brighter. Um, that's bad for um, uh, solar thermal plants that you know, reflect sight, sunlight and concentrate it. Uh, it's probably good for solar photovoltaic because it means that they'll get more energy from different directions. Um, and that's also one of these things that has interesting unknown ecosystem impacts because you're increasing the light that's coming from all sorts of different directions and decreasing the light that's coming straight from the sun. Yeah, and I'd also add that um, part of the problem with wind and solar is the variability, right? The wind only blow you can only get generate electricity when the wind's blowing or the sun is, is shining. So you need to be able to compensate for that variability. So a, lot, a, a number of ways to, uh, uh, methods to store energy so you can time shift it from when it's produced to when it's actually needed uh, that are, uh, are being developed and, and um, uh, beyond just simply thinking about batteries. Um, uh, and, and both of us showed this graph that showed that we had to get negative emissions roughly by the middle of the century, and it was actually part of the point of departure for one of the, the, these questions. What that is saying is that we can't do it with wind and solar and other renewable energies alone. We have to be extracting carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere very actively in order to get on this path where we limit uh, it to 1.5 degrees uh, um, Celsius by the end of the, 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 the century. Um, some people will say, hey, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is great. Use carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. We'll grow more plants, right? We'll go, the trees will be more productive and so on. Well, so will the weeds. Um, <laughs> and, and so, so it, it, there's, there's often like uh, uh, a downside to some of the, the upsides that we can, we can, we can, we can think of. Um, uh, there's also been work that says, well, yes, we need to totally scale up wind and solar, put more turbines out there, more photovoltaics out there, and so on, and have uh, technologies that increase the utilization of that capacity so you're not just limited to when the wind is blowing and the sun is, is shining. But when you think about it, you're putting wind turbines out there, you're, you're pulling energy out of the wind. You're extracting energy from the atmosphere, really. And that can affect the climate as well. And in fact, um, there's a, a study actually you've published with David, haven't you? I yeah. published with David, but not on that subject. Not on that, but you know what I'm talking and about. And I published with Ken, but not yeah. on that subject. So some of the best places to put wind <laughs> turbines in the United States is along the Rocky Mountains. What happens is the prevailing, uh, uh, well, you would know this too, the prevailing um, wind currents get lifted up from, from Rocky, the Rockies and then basically come back down in Europe. It's part of the reason that Europe is a pretty temperate climate. We put wind turbines there, we're extracting that energy and we're, we're screwing with Europe. You have to do that on a pretty massive on scale. On a pretty massive scale, yeah. It actually, but I, it I is wanna, true. I want to I I compare that magnitude to, what, to, the, to the one and a half degrees deployment stuff. So, so and another thing is, so yes, we can do a lot of wind and solar and, we can, and, and, uh, and geothermal. Uh, the problem, part of the problem is and making a substantial dent in CO2 emissions and, and, and climate warming. The problem is, to, as you scale up, it gets increasingly costlier and costlier because you're using a mar more marginal resources, right? You're not putting the wind turbines in the most windiest place, for example. Um, so technological optimism might have to be constrained a little by economic uh, realism. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we're going to wrap up there. If you could join me in thanking our speakers.